thank you so much for um, setting time aside for this interview. You, you know, I'm a fan. <laughs> I'm a big fan. <laughs> so I can't wait to hear more about you and your brand, your inspiration. So I guess first off, um, why don't you tell us about yourself? Like, where are you from? Um, your pronouns, where you were born and raised, how that might influence your design aesthetic. Mm. So my name is Noel Cuello. I am Dominican by ethnicity. Um, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, but I was raised in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, to identify as trans or gender fluid, and that's her spectrum. I mean, I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. So if anyone knows Providence, Rhode Island, it's very small. Um, it is a city. It's very low income, primarily Dominican and other Caribbean people, um, also very heavily Black. Um, but and there's like in the same ways that like most cities have like very pockets of like whiteness, there's the same, it's that same sort of dynamic where like Wine Street is extremely gentrified and the next street after is like a completely different, like you're in the hood. Um, but I think my upbringing in Providence has really thinking about accessibility and sustainability. I think that's where that starts from. I used to go to this youth program called New Urban Arts and a majority of their materials were donated or older clothing or fabric that no longer people no longer wanted. We have a recycling center. So that was also like a really big space for us to like get materials from. And so at that time, I wasn't necessarily that invested into clothing making or anything like that. I was just really obsessed with fabric at the time. I was like, oh, what sculptures? How can I deconstruct this to like make it firm? Like, can I add glue to it? They, in what ways can fabric? And so a lot of my work in high school was in that direction. How can I get discarded materials to function in a way that is desirable or in a way that will explain what I'm thinking? You know, like I think that at the time the formal practices of making weren't that important. So like I didn't learn how to draw, I didn't learn how to like sculpt clay or anything like that. I was very invested into like how can I have an idea and a thought and then just translate that into the thing that I'm making? Um, so like seeing, you know, my family grew up very low income and they still are. So like a lot of our like dish rags or, you know, towels or things like that are just old t-shirts that we no longer use. <laughs> or even like, like mops, like sometimes my mother if we didn't have a mop at the time or if we were transitioning from like one space to another, Dominicans don't believe in bringing their older, like things that clean the house. Like it's bad luck. You don't bring your dirt from another place. So my mother would just get a pole and just mop the floor with a t-shirt. And a lot of my understanding of making has stemmed from that of like, how can I constantly reconfigure something that already exists? And so I think Providence, the aesthetic of Providence is very much oversized sweater from Goodwill that are just or savers. Savers is a really big thing. And really short shorts that you were like that were former jeans that you would just cut off. And like Tim's or some form of like hiker boots. And I think <laughs> and I'm a person who loves an oversized aesthetic. And I think a lot of like my work is oversized too. And then I try to like manipulate it in ways so that people can cinch it if they want to. But I think that has always been my like guide to making is like oh how can I the oversized sweater was always like a really nice sweater like it was never like yes it was from Goodwill but it was like obviously hand knitted or maybe it was like a Ralph Lauren that knows someone didn't want anymore and so I really thought about that like high low aesthetic like how can I pair a really sparkly dress with some jeans and like how can I make that aesthetically pleasing or can we put you know like palazzo pants with tins like can we do that is that like a thing like does that look aesthetically pleasing and so I think a lot of my influence is very geared towards the providence like aesthetic so something oversized something a little bit tighter form fitting to the body and whatever shooting feels comfortable for you you know that's great I love hearing about that um and I'm actually wearing one of your works right now this this is a Nueva Puelo sweatshirt that I'm wearing 
that mm-hmm. I absolutely love. I always get compliments on it. Um, people always ask me where I got it from. I always tell them, follow Noel. <laughs> Can you tell us more about this, this sweatshirt? I'm, so, and I use a lot of, um, a majority of my practice is either dead stock fabric or clothing from Goodwill that no longer serves a purpose. So I do these like Goodwill <laughs> runs where I'll buy like 28 over like just button up shirts that I like the pattern on them or the color solid. And then, uh, you know, it's when winter comes around, I'll just buy all the sweaters that are primarily cotton. I try to get more things that, I try to get things that are natural fibers, so like silk, um, mohair, stuff like that, that like will actually take dye and be able to be manipulated some more. So the sweater you're wearing is a cotton sweater. <laughs> and I like, there's there's moments where I'm like, I really want to be and just recreate it into something beautiful. Um, and there are other moments where I'm like, I studied fiber material studies for my undergrad and my graduate degree. And there were so many skills that I just felt like I was no longer using. Like I'm no longer weaving, which weaving was like my life in college. Um, and I just wasn't doing, I wasn't doing enough fiber practices. So when I had, I bought like 12 sweaters that were all kind of different sizes of different like meters. Um, I just really wanted to play with dye. So the one that you're wearing, I like over dyed it. So like I dyed it with one layer and just kept on going and kept on going until like I finally found a middle ground that I liked. And then in the same way that like there are some painters who will overpaint and then will like chip some of it off. I find that bleach does a similar thing <laughs> with clothing. I think that like it's, I find it a lot of fun to be able to get the solid colors and see what's happening. Cause you know, like dye is kind of unpredictable. It kind of does whatever it wants to do. So it's like, I could have dyed your, your I could have intended to dye your sweater orange, black and white. And look, you have reds and there's blues and that just dye does that um, in such a beautiful way. But because it's so unpredictable sometimes when you're mixing dyes, um, I, then I go in with bleach instead of like try to like play with it a little bit more and try to give it some light spaces and some dark spaces. And the way I dye is very untraditional and most people would say very wasteful. Um, but I dye in a way that just feels good to me. Because I know there's like a, you dye, you like you take the dye, you put it in water and then you sort of spread it around. So what I would do is I would layer it like a lasagna. So I would get the sweaters, I would put them in the the salt solution, and then I would take the dye and just put it directly on the sweater itself. And then I would layer another sweater over it and then do that, keep on doing that same process. And then I would roll it up and then leave it in the bag for a week and just see what colors would happen. And I think that for me, that worked out really beautiful because like, the dye is richer, like the, it's directly on the fabric. So you get a really deep black, you get a really deep blue, you get deep purples. And I'm more interested in this like hyper saturation of it than, than trying to get like a perfect color. So that's what your sweater is doing for sure. Cause I think the original color of that sweater was like a very light cream. And so then like the dye just sort of did whatever I wanted to do. And I more, I'm more excited about surprises than I am about tradition. So I think that's 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 what we're doing. Wow, well, I love it. It looks great. <laughs> um, and you know, one thing I love about you as a designer and as a maker and artist is that when you make a garment, you're not interested in a specific gender. Like you mm-hmm. said, you identify as trans, and um, you have trans people in mind when you're making clothing and you just have people in mind regardless of how they identify um and i wonder if you could talk about sort of the radical inclusivity of your brand because i think out of anyone honestly who's out there like making i think you do it best like this is really like (laughs) because you know some people (laughs) You know, some people when they do like, yeah, they, they, it's like it's just about covering and not about really like accentuating. And that's what I really like about mm-hmm. your work. Like, you're not a, you're not a, like the the way they deal with like unisex fashion. I don't like that term, by the way. <laughs> I don't like that term unisex fashion. But the way they do unisex fashion is like they just 
cover the body. And you're not you're not, you're not necessarily about covering yeah. the body, you're about about situating the body. Absolutely. I'm like my obsession is to make sure that someone feels either extremely sexy or like even because my clothing isn't isn't very traditional in the way that like it's a t-shirt. It's like a very specifically cut dress. Like sometimes I just take all <laughs> everything that I have and try to make it into something. Um, and because it's mostly upcycled, you can unbutton things or you can tie things and you can really be particular about how you maneuver it to your body. Well, you know, I grew up, you know, I'm, my family's Afro-Latinx and these are all women of like every single size, you know, like we have plus size and we have smaller women, like we have everyone of every different stature. Growing up, like in high school and mostly when I went to college, like that's really where I like I was exploring gender and exploring my identity in that way and so I just attracted more people who were gender variant or people who were like queer but didn't necessarily like come out as queer just yet and people just like identifying with all different factors of their existence and I was really obsessed with that like I was like oh like we really get to decide like what we want to be the world might not accept that but like who gives a fuck you <laughs> know like or who cares you know like I get to do whatever I want and I wanted my clothing to do the same and I was so when I first got when I first went to go get my undergrad degree I went into fashion I like went directly into fashion and I hated every single second of it and it was mostly because fashion is binary like it was very particular about to like who like the croquis, the croquis are all women and they're all, you know, it's supposed to be like cis women drawings, you know, or who you're making clothing for. It's like, are you doing women's wear? Are you doing men's wear? Are you doing lingerie? Are you doing bridal? And I was not interested in any of those dynamics. Like, I was like, I just want to make things <laughs> and I want people to feel good about the things that I'm wearing and I want to be politically corrupt. No, or I want to be ethical and I want to be someone who is constantly understanding what is happening in the world and then shifting things based off of my understanding. And so I didn't want, I don't gender my clothing. I don't, you know, like I, the people who model for me, it's a lot of trans people who model for me and also cis, mostly because she's available and willing, <laughs> but I as different representation as I can. And I don't care about, like I just had a recent drop and the person who the person who I'm seeing is the person who I put in the clothes and it's mostly dresses and he's a cis man and I you know that doesn't that's irrelevant to me and people are still buying it people women trans people or whoever identifies as what they buy what makes them feel comfortable and I was more invested about that comfortability than anything and so I try and try to not pinpoint myself in one box I just want everyone to feel good, you know? Um, and even, like, now, like, I was recently commissioned to do a wedding dress. Um, and it's not for a woman. And so, like, that is also, like, again, someone feels good enough to trust me into making a very important dress, which I'm mortified for. But, <laughs> but into making, it like, a dress that's for their day for a non-binary person and just make them feel like as good as possible. And they trust me with that. And that has been such a rewarding aspect about making. Because I think that like, for me, again, I I studied fibers. And so for me, that's a very political realm of like how we identify what we're doing or like why craft is important. Um, and so like fashion does the exact opposite in a lot of ways. And so I was like, oh, how can I merge the two together and be hyper-political and then also be understanding of bodies of every different size and price and visibility breast no breast ass no ass whatever it means you know yeah so when you're designing um how do you conceptualize the body or do you think about the body do you think about the textile like how does that figure in your head yeah so i again i i studied for one year in fashion and then dropped out one semester actually <laughs> and then i moved into so I have no traditional training. Like I, like I can't. I think I slept most of my classes because I was so bored. Um, so I can't even make a pattern. I think that's why upcycling is so beautiful because it already is pattern based, and so like, you can just manipulate it from there. But I have. I kind of do it the way that I guess like traditional 
traditional, not traditional, but not traditional makers do just have mannequin and then I just drape on the mannequin mm-hmm. and hope for the best. Who mm-hmm. who in mind, but I do have in mind I I've always been a larger person. Like I've just always been like a size twenty to twenty four, twenty six, like whatever. Um and I could never find things in my friends' closets that if I needed to change into something, I could change something that they had. And so I was very invested when starting making clothing. I was like, how can I make clothing that is accessible to multiple bodies so that if someone does go into your closet, someone of my size, smaller, can fit into it. And so when I think of clothing, at least when I make something very traditional, like, like quote unquote, a dress, if I make a dress, I make sure that there's always enough space so that if one loses weight or gains weight, there's room for you to for you to grow or for you to shrink in whatever way possible. And you can always, and that's the beautiful thing about fashion too, is that you can cinch things in with the belt or <laughs> or you can get things taken in if you want it to be smaller. But I try to give enough in everything that I make, I try to put enough fabric in it. Or I start with the bigger size. Like I'm I don't very rarely do I have do I buy clothing that starts in a medium or small. I normally buy, and that's like a like I even with like my oversized button ups, like I make them massive. Like these are things that are like size 24, 26, 28, 30. Um and I enjoy it in that, like I want it to be that way. Like I want it to be very specific towards bodies shifting and changing. So like I try when my when I make a piece of clothing. I make sure that there's a lot of fabric there and not in a wasteful way, but in a way that's really like conscious about, I like the (laughs) A-line because it like, or maybe not A-line, like I like, what is it called? The hoop skirt? Like, or circle skirt. The way that a circle skirt works is that it's like smaller at one point and then it expands out into the bottom. And so I try to think of my clothing in that way. I'm like, can I make it so that it's more specific to someone's like arms or like like comfortable to like multiple arms and then have the bottom be open so that your body can shift and change in whatever way that it needs to be possible you know and I've made a lot of clothing for like like I make these ruffled dresses very often and those fit my friends who are size zero and those fit my friends who are size 30 32 and that's like such a drastic change or I even made one for my niece who is eight years old and then my mother put it on, who she's like a 40-year-old woman, a plus size 40 year old woman, and she tried it on and it fit her. And even I was a little bit surprised. Because that was, you know, that my mind it wasn't my mind, it was intentional just to make something for my niece and her size, because she's a you know, she's a tiny little thing. And then my mother put it on as a t-shirt. And I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> like I loved it. You know, one thing that really strikes me about your work is the textile choice. Like you're not afraid of color, you're not afraid of print, but also sustainability is something that you care about. Like you said, you've already mentioned that you typically use recycled or um, dead stock fabrics. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about materiality and the kind of fabrics that you gravitate towards. Yeah, I so <laughs> the people who I like in undergrad, there was this one girl. Um, I can't remember her last name, but her first name was Emily. And she was always like, every single semester was obsessed with sustainability. <laughs> she was just like, I need to, I need to print ethically. I need to, uh, so all of her screen prints were like, saying like she used beet juice or she used some sort of like dye from some sort of plant. And she was always very dedicated to like, always using the most natural, the most ethical, the most just the most sustainable and I think from watching her make her clothing was always really interesting but I I just loved her passion about the way that she was talking about it and then I would watch these documentaries about you know how indigo dyeing works in India or in Japan and like how like synthetic dyes are more popular now because it's kind of hard to get this hard to plant indigo or even like they send these like really large bins to I can't remember where in Africa but I want to say it's like Lagos or something like that and they send these like massive bins of clothing that people like 
you can either get like a really fancy one and it's like strictly clothing or you can get like a, a like an okay one and then it'll be clothing and trash and so they ship these like massive containers to them and these people are trying to like make as much money as they can off of it and they don't make that much money anyways but it's like all of our used clothing in america or all a whole bunch of like things that no longer work at h&m or the amount of like impractical fast fashion that is produced in america like they make things so that they know that they can sell it for a profit after so they make things that are like obviously not going to work out that have holes that they overmake for a reason and so like they're every single aspect of their overmaking they're making that profit back tenfold so they're making what goes into the store and then what they resell to like random ass people and i just kept on thinking a lot about I love fabric. I genuinely love fabric. I love the way that it's made. Again, I think, and I was really invested in natural dyes and just weaving structures. And the practice in the beginning, I only made clothing that I wove myself and I spun myself, spun a lot of my own thread. And I would make a lot of my own yarn and I would dye everything by hand. And I was very invested into being a part of every single part of the process outside of like the shearing of the um the sheep even though i have done that before but there's a lot of like poop and piss and like the actual, <laughs> actual like, wool and i'm like i'm not, I'm not about that and i am not gonna pick cotton soon so there's a lot of like structural things like okay what am i going to be a part of and what am i not going to be a part of um what are my ancestors would care for and what are what my ancestors are like girl just just give up on that um, so I was like, okay, I won't be a part of the raw material process, but I'll be a part of the other aspect of it. And so everything I did was hand done. A, that's extremely time consuming. <laughs> B, that's, um, if I were to like sell it for like an ethical price, it's very unaffordable to like people who, like I care for and the people in my communities who are of low income. And so I was like, okay, like how can I do, how can I make things that feel really beautiful that are colorful and bright and like really light up people's eyes and you know i come from a culture where like color is extremely important like we women dress up like church culture is so important and no one is dressing in black unless it's a funeral so you have these like bright fuchsias bright oranges like everyone has a suit a pencil skirt the hat and the shoes to match and i i grew up as i grew up catholic so church was really important for me growing up so i went so i always saw these like really beautiful bright colors and so i was like oh like how can i replicate that in a way that i'm a low income person and like i'm poor <laughs> or like not poor poor but like i'm getting by as i can so I'm like, okay, how do I like get materials in a way that A, I can afford it myself, but B, I could sell it that it's still at an affordable price. And that's why I do a sliding scale is primarily so that like people can really decide how like how much they can afford. And so the lowest end of the sliding scale is always how much the fabric costs and then my time. Just like generic, like if I were just to do $15 an hour, how much would this piece cost? And the highest end of it is like, you're also paying for my experience and you're paying for my, like all of the other things that go into it and all of the, like the me scavenger hunting for things or the amount of like education that I have, or, you know, like what any high-end designer would charge for any sort of product. So I like gravitated toward dead stock fabric, mostly because it's like, it's things from the seventies, eighties and the sixties. And so print and color, even if it's dead stock, it's still so rich. Like, I don't know how, this fabric is holding it so beautifully. And I think it's mostly because it's in dark spaces. Like they just hide it in some warehouse and kind of like keep it there for a while. And if there's no sun, if they're, if the sun isn't washing it out, then like you still have all of these things with a really beautiful color. So that, and then I, most of my clothing is made out of men's button-ups. And I, I grew up wearing a lot of plaid and a lot of just like traditional men's button-ups just because like, I was always a bigger kid, so my weight was always fluctuating. And also that's what fit, that's what was comfortable. And it was the early 2000s, so that aesthetically it worked for me. <laughs> um, and I, cause I wasn't into like FUBU yet. And I wasn't like, it just, my body was always changing. So I just didn't have the ability to build an aesthetic that was mine. I just built what was available. And my family also had a lot of hand-me-downs. So I just wore whatever somebody else worn before. 
but a lot of my clothing is made out of men's button ups and men's button ups are very plain very blue. um but very bright colored if not if it's not the traditional blue white and black most of them have like either paisley or bright yellows or pinks i remember like at one point like 2012 like light pink was just such a big color and men were wearing light pink and it was so revolutionary for men to wear white pink so i was like really invested into that so and i think so i gravitate towards that a because it's mostly mostly cotton because it's woven so like i can dye it after two if i need to um just in case i want either a brighter color i want to reduce the color or play around with the color in any sort of way um but also like it's a woven fabric i think that like for plus size people a majority of the clothing that we're given is jersey is a stretch fabric is a knit and i have never felt comfortable in any of those fabrics mostly because things to your body and so like every single aspect of everything is being exposed and not that there are moments where i like that and there are moments where i don't and i you know my every day is mostly on the don't side uh, so i was like okay like i want a woven fabric for larger people like we also deserve it too and i think a lot of it's because it's, it's more expensive and like jersey is like more cost efficient so i gravitate towards dead stock men's button-ups and anything that's like a natural fabric just so i can constantly be it's a lot of control it's like i can have control of the shape of every shape that i want to do i can have control of color i can play with color in any way that i want to Specifically, because if not, if it's a natural fabric, then the synthetic dyes go into it so beautifully and so much more easier. Instead of the opposite way around, if it's a synthetic fabric, then I have to use the synthetic dyes, and those don't really work. They they're not as bright or colorful. And then, yeah, and then it's just like it's more ethical for our planet. You know, like it's like let's use what we already have instead of producing so much more like we just have to fast fashion is really polluting our world in a way that like you know we're dealing with the repercussions now like global warming is, is here to stay and like our oceans are polluted in a lot of ways and the way that we have access to things like things are not decomposing and i wonder why you <laughs> know like <laughs> it's like we need to be more conscious and ethical about our consumption but i also understand the realities of it too is that like fast fashion is just cheap and most people can't afford to spend three to four hundred dollars on one garment when you're expected to go into workforce and to wear several garments, you know? And so it's like I get both ends of this I get both ends of the spectrum. But I try to have my clothing and the things that I make be multifunctional and also ethical at the same time. And also as you mentioned, um, you use a sliding scale. And so um, you know, it can be as cheap as not cheap, as affordable as sixty, seventy, eighty dollars, or mm -hmm. several hundred dollars. So, you know, you're accommodating people at who coming from different um, economic situations, and also your brand lives primarily on social media. Um, you, mm -hmm. it's, and it's often how you announce like drops or what we, what we refer to as drops or like. <laughs> upcoming sales of your of your garments um i wonder if you could talk a little bit about um your decision to use a sliding scale model because i think it's something that more designers should do but also how social media and the internet has been an influence on you absolutely i think like and that's the like i grew up in providence Rhode Island, and providence is like it's filled with artists and it's filled with a lot of people who are like it's very community based and like the program that I went to when I was a teenager, it was all about love. Like it was all about first thing when you get to the door, it's like a good hug from somebody. It's like very much like it's just it's care. It's like such a deep sense of care. And I think Providence really holds to that. It's just, it's just a very loving space. And I know a lot of people who come out of Providence go into spaces looking for that same sort of affection or come to Providence because they know it's there. And so the program that I was in, because it was mostly youth, um, but also like, you know, there were full grown adults who were like selling their work. The people who were selling their prints or clothing were always writing themselves so that it was. Mm -hmm. 
at least not for me <laughs> like sixty dollars was a lot of money back then and like trying to find sixty dollars to like buy someone's work and you know and the deserving of so much more money but what I could afford was the lower end of the sliding scale and so when I was making my price points I was like oh I need to do the same thing too like I need to make sure that if young people want to buy my clothing, there's an accessibility to it. And I want everyone to be accessible. I want it to be accessible to everyone. And I want everyone to consider how much they're spending. And so I tell them, like, I try to be very clear about, please don't feel afraid to spend the lower end of the sliding scale. Like, I have a skill for a reason. You know, like, if I was uncomfortable with it, I would, <laughs> I would, add, I would make it higher. And there are certain things that I do put on a higher sliding scale because I can't afford, you know, it's a lot of fabric or something like that. If it's like a very large ruffled gown, like I just, I can't realistically afford to put it at 80, but I could do it at 120, you know, like, and that feels comfortable and good for me. <laughs> And then also just thinking about, I do everything on social media and I'm not, there's ups and downs to sliding skills. So the, the up to it is that there, I could sell a piece for $800 and I'm like, oh my God, I just made rent, you know, like, and that feels so good and it feels so bizarre and, but really like, oh my God, like I just, as someone, someone it can afford to pay that price. And then the, the on the other hand, there are times where like I'll make twenty pieces and I'll only get at the lower end of the sliding scale, and so then I barely made rent, you know. And so it's an up and down type of like situation, um, and it mostly just affects me at the, at the long run. And so I do have to reconsider, or I'm in constant I'm in constant conversation with my community on Instagram about like, hey, like. I love y'all. And I know that some of y'all want to buy two to three, four pieces at the lower end because you want to support my work and you really love what you just saw. But could we think about this ethically in a way that like is also supportive of me being able to make these things for you? So if you can afford to buy four pieces, why not buy one or two? <laughs> and then I like, and then I have more work to sell. And then like I feel better about you know handing this thing off to you knowing that you can afford multiple garments but you're ethically thinking about your spending and how many pieces you actually really need um and i think that's where social media comes into play a lot too is that like i think i'm assuming <laughs> that a lot of my followers or people who like like my work or you know are fans of mine or whatever I think it's because I'm able to also have like a conversation with them too. And so I'm very transparent on social media about life updates or how making is going or, you know, being really clear about like why I do a sliding scale, why a sliding scale is there, or even even it open to like payment plans. You can put my clothes on layaway, that's fine. <laughs> I don't mind. Um, and social media has been such a strong I think I saw someone else do a drop and I saw how successful their drop was because there's an excitement to it it's like oh my god within a month there's gonna be like 20 more pieces and they're gonna sell out right away and so like I need to go buy my thing now I need to save up now and so I'm like oh my god that model really works for me as a person who makes kind of slowly and who isn't making when the pandemic first started, I could make 70 pieces and feel and like in, in like two to three months and feel very good about it and then just try to sell that as hard as hard as I can. The pandemic is now is not over, but it's not as like there's more responsibility now and people are going back to work and things are like speeding up again. And so like I don't have the necessarily the time to do it the same way I did before. But that pandemic, the beginning of the pandemic was such, it was a blissful moment for me in my making because I didn't have to focus. I was teaching at the time. I didn't have to teach anymore because, you know, everybody was laid off. And, you know, I was, I was getting unemployment. So that was like also really helpful. And it was just like, I just had a moment to sit still. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to take advantage of this moment and just make as much as I can and then start developing what I quote unquote call a brand, you know, <laughs> even though I find myself to being, I don't, I call it a brand because of like, that's the terminology that people use. I'm just like, I just make things, you know, <laughs> just make things that I like, you can wear it and you can buy it, you know? Um, but 
social media has been uh, like a God-given sense because I'm like, I don't, I can't afford a website just yet. And I also, I'm just not that tech savvy in that way. Like I'm not, that's also why I went into craft because it was a lot easier to work with your hands and to be more conscious about how you're doing things there. And I just, I can't, the tech part of a lot of things I'm not good at. I'm not good at writing grants. I'm just not like, those, my brain doesn't work that way. My brain really works tactile. And like, how do I make a thing, make a thing, make a thing. And Instagram makes it really easy. It's like, hey, upload 10 pictures, put a price point under it, and then tell people to send you messages if they want to buy it, you know? And so it's just been so comforting and easy. And I wish I knew how to do the TikTok stuff because I feel like that I could get my brand to be a lot bigger. But even again, TikTok feels a little bit confusing to me too. I'm like, oh, so am I supposed to dance for people? Do I show them my little... <laughs> like, what do I do on that app that would make people like me quickly so that I won't have to do it forever? But that's the thing, too, is that people who do things like like Instagram, I can upload one thing a week, and that's like a fine thing. TikTok, you have to be uploading every single day or people like, so you die out. So, yeah, so Instagram has been my platform for selling, for visibility, for access in every single way. And it's a free thing. Like, you know, like everyone has access to Instagram. And then it also makes it easier for me in a way that like trying to configure a website store for sliding scale just isn't realistic. So like Instagram, I can just like, I can have a conversation with someone and be like, hey, like let's figure it out. And like, like you can do PayPal, Cash App, Venmo, whatever works for you. You can sell me if that makes more sense. Like, it's just an easier way to communicate with people and to like be a human. You know, like I don't have to like be the brand Noel Puelo and like have a formal website and like have people like come and buy my work and look at the history of it. You could just see like my Instagram and that has enough history of like the people wearing it. And I think that's more important to me is to show that like hey, this t-shirt, three t-shirts that I sold together and died, and now you have three armholes and four head holes and stuff like that. Like, now look at this person wearing it and the way that they wore it and look how easy and functional it is. And then I think that gives an easier an, e- an easier connectability to, like, wanting to buy my work that's a lot more out of the box than my more, like, traditional looking type of stuff. Yeah, and you said, you know, like the term brand which i completely understand brand sounds very capitalistic and i feel like what you're describing is more of like conversations and like also like community building like ah. you, so it's a good conduit for connecting people and like people who love creativity and expression and, and so that's, i feel like it's, it's less of a you know corporate identity and more of a, a sort of <laughs> for conversations and community mm-hmm. and I'm that's what I'm interested in I'm like I don't like there's like so much conversation around like the traditional and traditional question that people ask designers all the time is like who would you love to see wearing your clothes and I'm like my auntie like that's what I want to see wearing my clothes like I want people on the street random ass people wearing a Noel Pillow original and not Rihanna would be nice of course who wouldn't want Rihanna Stuff, but I'm like that's not my target audience like my target audience is just my grandmother people who I grew up with in my community like I, I want it to be accessible to everybody and so like the celebrity is nice but not the most important thing to me so speaking of those kind of questions um I'm, <laughs> I'm wondering if you can tell me you know who or what inspires you besides your grandmother mm-hmm. Or you know, family. I think for me, <laughs> I you know I went to art school for eight, for years. Um, so I spent six. I went to six years. Um, but I like spent so much digesting a lot of art, a lot of art, a lot of designers, and I hate going to museums. <laughs> I just. I'm not, like, I'm just not the type of person to, like, can sit there and, like, look at things that I have no interest in or that aren't relatable. But I think I was able to find, I just wanted to find, like, people who just were a little bit the other. And so in terms of, like, artists, I think for sure David Hammonds, he's, like, 
love of my life. You know, if I could just meet him for just a couple of seconds and just breathe his air, I would be, that's it. I can, I'm done. You know, I'm done. I can, I can live my life now. Um, I think his work really, I, there was something, there was something about these paintings that he did where he would like do the painting itself. And then he would put these like tarps over them and you could, and, but it would be like, it would, what is it called it's like they were kind of tattered so you can kind of see like parts of the painting through the tarp and I think for me that was like explosive because I was like oh like you can really you can really manipulate the way that people see your work and you can decide what they're going to see and I felt like a lot of my practice is like oh I want you to see the cloth that's important and that's like where my dye comes in because I'm like, okay, like, I'm going to force you to see the, like, importance of this fabric by making it louder than what it's supposed to be. So his work for sure is, like, inspirational. Um, there's a friend of mine, Warif Taha. I think his work is, like, also, like, he's constantly using discarded items and using, like, Black pornography, specifically, like, queer Black pornography, and, like, manipulating the way that we see and objectify Black bodies. And I think his work is really like something that I look towards. Um, and then designer wise, <sighs> Alexander McQueen, rest his soul. But when he, when I first saw those armadillo shoes, I knew where I wanted to be. I was like, I want to be in fashion, like fashion. I want to be there. I want like those armadillo shoes and his Pluto Atlantis um fashion show was like my first was like the first fashion show that I've ever seen like I not not in person but just like online googling like fashion and I was like after that I was obsessed like I could not I watched every single one of his shows because his website used to have the archive too so I watched his first show all the way up until 20 that 2012 when which is when I was looking at the stuff and I was mesmerized by like you can give a performance in a fashion show that is not just about the clothing. Like you can literally have a storyline, a conversation, uh, like it just, it felt more like theater than it was fashion. I think that really changed the way that I thought about like what I wanted to do in this lifetime. I was like, I'm not interested in having fashion shows. I'm interested in like, I'm also obsessed with movies. So movies are for sure an inspiration. But I love watching movies and I love seeing the way that people are moving in the garden and like and living by. And so watching an Alexander McQueen show is just your genius. And then right now, I guess like more contemporary, I would say Luar is another brand who I'm really obsessed with. Um he's a Dominican designer and I think he's in New York too. Um phenomenal for just his clothing is just it doesn't make sense to me and i think that's why i enjoy it so much because i'm like i don't understand the construction of it and how you're able to make these things and i would love to just spend time just like deconstructing one piece and then trying to reconstruct it and seeing what happens um christopher john rogers is you know everyone <laughs> and color it's just it's he does color so well and the color and then he also does things where it's like he brings the 70s into certain things and he references Patrick Kelly a lot, who's also another amazing designer. Um, and it's just like, I'm obsessed. He's another one who I'm obsessed with. Um, and I think that is for designer wise. But I really think that like movies are the things that like really shift the way that I think about clothing, performance, and people. There was this horror movie called Suspiria. And the most recent one, because there was one from the 70s, but I saw the, the 2000 one, that just, I think it was 20, I think it came out either 2019 or 2018. But just, I was obsessed. And it's a horror, and it's, a, it's a horror movie. These women are contorting and twisting their bodies. But there was visual language, like the Valentinos in it, the Irm is just the way that the fabric moved on these women because it was like a dance school but it was like a horror dance school so you know some crazy shit happened but it was just so beautiful to see the like the chiffon moving in the wind or there's one scene where this girl is wearing this like really beautifully crisp brown cape 
and the whitest of snow and you just see that like brown just like it's just it popped on the screen because like it's just everything is white because it's literally covered in snow as germany or something like that and that brown just was so rich and hurt she had the like the leather gloves on and it was just such a classic moment of like fashion and cinema and like i and they probably sold out of that of that cape i, I don't doubt it it was probably like a gucci cape i didn't i didn't even look it up but it was it was phenomenal um or even like when the pandemic started there were more people invested into like fashion films and like fashion like just visual fashion things that were more digital so i know i want to say that it was gucci it was either gucci or balenciaga that did that did these like little series of fashion films. And so I did like an eight part series and they gave it to a director. They gave the clothing to a director and they were like, okay, like this is your scene. You do whatever you want with it. And that was like magic to me. I ate that up. Please feed me that all the time. Cause it was, it, it was just so again, visually stunning. And like, you got to see the clothing move on people and, like, we've seen it on the runway, but, like, I want to see it just, like, what happens when you sit down and your stomach, like, pushes out and, like, what happens to the clothing then? Like, what happens when the wind is on you? What happens when the sun is shining on the sequence? Like, how bright does it, does it become? And I think that is a lot of where my influence comes from, is, like, seeing fashion and film sort of collide. Oh, that was great. I love that description. That was beautiful. <laughs> I have one more question for you. Um, I'm wondering, you know, you're you're um, logging in from Mexico City right now, and you know, you have a lot of things going on. You just got a delivery of some fabric, so you're you're busy at work. So I don't want to take up too much too much more of your time, but I'm just wondering about um, new directions that um, I don't want to say brand. <laughs> how to how you're pushing the conversation forward how this project is moving forward new new things you're thinking about or working on and where people can follow you absolutely so you can follow me n-o-e-l underscore p-u-e-l-l-o it's noel underscore puello this is my name um on instagram and most of my jobs and most of my sales and everything that i do is on there um but it's <sighs> where am i going <laughs> Actually, of my direction of my work right now I think I'm currently living in Mexico and I really enjoy living here and I'm trying to stay here for as long as but it's like a foreigner not be Mexico is very inexpensive in a lot of ways but getting and trying to get an apartment and living here is like a foreigner is a little bit more complicated because you have to have a lot of these paperwork and they want you to have like a full-time job and all this type of stuff and you know being an artist like that's kind of tricky within like, you know, what is taxable, what is not, what is like just things. But I think right now, right now we're trying to figure out survival. <laughs> so I'm like, is is the sliding scale a realistic thing to move forward into the future as a person who is getting older in age and trying to be realistic about like what I want the work to do. So like, I would like to have a website at some point. I would like to do more films. I would like to have more time for specific projects. I would like to go on vacation. I would like to have things that feel that I that feel traditional to everyone who's like working really hard on certain things. So I'm like exciting skills the thing I have to really consider and question and think about some more. Um, and then the work right now, because I've moved here and because I mean, you know, I might have taken a couple months off to do absolutely nothing. <laughs> and, you know, that might have depleted my feelings. But, you know, like, we're here. We're alive. We're present. So right now, the work has been going in a direction of, like, what are things that people really desire? So it's thinking of it in a more capitalistic way. And, like, I need to make money quickly. How do I make money quickly? So, you know, I've been making things that feel very traditional to, like, what sells out really fast. But I think I would love my dream right now, <laughs> my desire, my like, I would love to just get like a grant. If I can get a grant for like 10 grand or donations for like 10 grand, I don't know. Like I just need to get like a certain chunk of money so that I can then 
go back into making clothing that feels less like traditional clothing. Like I kind of miss, I really miss just buying, like literally going into Goodwill, buying 10 items of whatever, I don't even care what they are and really deconstructing them and then reconstructing them into something completely different. And I really miss that part of my practice. I also miss dyeing. Dyeing is like, it's kind of expensive to do here because everything is imported from America. So getting the import is kind of expensive. Um, but I miss dye. Like I just miss playing with dye and like doing a really intense dye practice and trying to figure that out. Um, but I, I think that's where my brand is wanting to go. It has an, it has aspirations to have like a full, I would like to do a 20 piece lookbook that is very traditional in the sense of like, okay, like I have models, I have people wearing the clothing, they're like beautifully like every the shoes, the like the leggings, the every, like every single aspect of it is thought out. And I would love to do like like a very traditional just foot like photo like just what is it called? A photo shoot. I just like to do like a really nice photo shoot. Just so that I can then start applying for like I don't think I, you know, and this is me being pessimistic of myself. I don't think I would ever win the LVMH prize, but I would love to apply. You know, like I would love to be given the chance to apply. But that requires a very traditional portfolio and very traditional, like, us, like, stems of access. So it's like, they're going to ask, like, who is making things? What factory am I working with? And I found one here in Mexico City that specifically focuses on upcycling. So you, like, give... And you give them all the like clothing and then they just do the thing that you ask them to do, which is such a like, oh, it's been so revolutionary to see what comes out of there. Um, but I'm like, oh, then that, that would release some of that fear of like making fast fashion, but also like working ethically with like Mexican women here. And I would just feel a lot better because they're getting paid the way they should. And like the clothing is ethically coming out up second still but the caliber of like retail work you know so that would be really nice um but yeah i think like i think my my desire for sure is to make a film i would love to make a really beautiful film full of clothing full of like uh, interesting people and i would love for it to be something that feels very collaborative so that like you know i would love to build a team of like 10 people like a videographer, actors, singers, whatever, just to make something that like gives the clothing, that community that I talk about all the time or the community that I'm building on Instagram. Like I want to have like a physical representation of that. So I'm hoping if there are any like rich funders out there, <laughs> I'm just hoping that at some point my work gets to be, gets to have that, gets to have that life, you know? Like I wanted to have the life that other designers get to have access to too. Well, I have to say, one of the best things about articulating your dreams is that if anyone's listening and know of any resources or wants to contribute or donate to Noah Coelho, they can slide into your DMs. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so that said, if anyone's watching, know of any grants or resources or just wants to donate money, um, to Noah Puello, please slide into their DMs. And I'm, go I'm going to link your Instagram in the description of the video. <laughs> uh, and this has been a, a transformative conversation. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. I feel, again, I told you in the beginning, I feel very honored to do this. This feels really good in a lot of ways. Uh, what well, a feeling is mutual. <laughs>